Amy was hurrying. Once she learned what happened, she immediately packed her things, grabbed her kids, and started looking for a car that would take her there. She told her mother not to wait for her and set out on her way. Currently, she was staying with her sick mother. She needed help with the household chores, and Amy came to help. Her husband stayed back home. He said that he would come a little bit later once he was done with his own tasks. John was a great guy, kind, honest, hardworking, a loving husband and father, and the heart and soul of any company. He never complained about anything and always tried to help everyone. Actually, this was how they met. Amy, still very young then, slipped on an ice strip and fell hard, smacking the back of her head on the pavement. Are you okay? Maybe I should call an ambulance? She opened her eyes, and it seemed to her that she saw the stars. How pure and beautiful his eyes were. That day, John was late for a job interview because of her. But he saw her home and, making sure she was okay, he left. Amy got pretty upset then. He did not even ask her for her phone number. The next evening, however, she was in for a surprise. John, in all his glory, clad in a warm cap and a warm scarf, was tap dancing from the cold near her house entrance. Amy did not even recognize him at first and passed him by, hoping to make it to the comfort of her warm apartment as soon as possible. You won't even say hello? She froze in her tracks and then turned around. John? What are you doing here? Well, I've been waiting for you, but I seem to be quite cold now. Have you been here for a long time? I'm sorry I got delayed at work. Do come inside and get warm. He brought her a bag of tangerines and chocolates on that day to cheer her up and improve her health, as he explained. At first, they lived from hand to mouth. He was running around the city looking for work, but he didn't seem to find any. His parents did not help him either. Luckily, Amy had an apartment of her own. Her parents bought it for her back in the day. Amy was in her last university year, and the young couple struggled along. Sometimes the countless odd jobs that they scored did bring some decent money, and sometimes they did not even have enough money to buy bread. On these occasions, Amy swallowed her pride, went to her parents, and equivocally asked them for money, and they helped. Back then, her father was still alive. Amy's parents never showed a single sign that they didn't like their son-in-law. They supported the young family as best as they could. Sometimes they gave them money, and sometimes they just gave them groceries. Then John said, enough of that. He sold whatever valuables he had and became a shuttle trader. He traveled back and forth between Moscow and Istanbul, putting aside some money from what he was earning and, once he amassed a serious sum, he launched a business of his own. He started small by renting some premises in the basement, where he worked late into the night. By and by, he began to receive his first return on investment, he hired his first employees, they cranked up the production and his business began to gain momentum. Now they no longer had to think about their next meal. Amy and John finally got married. At the wedding, they heartily thanked Amy's parents for being with them through thick and thin, wiping away the happy tears. By then, Amy had already graduated from university and shared her husband's position at the helm of the company. They slaved together of their own accord until one morning Amy felt sick. They had a son. Now he'll soon turn 16. After the son, there were two twin sisters. Amy and John even got scared a little. Will they be able to support such a huge family? However, by then, John was already a real business owner who did not have to manage his company in manual mode. They had a large, steady income, and they bought a big, sturdy house so that everyone could have a room of their own plus a large kitchen. The whole family waited to move into that house. Again, Amy's parents helped with packing and unpacking things. Amy became a full-time mother, and John spent his days at the office, and then he hurried home. Once he became a big boss, he was never late from work and turned up inevitably at 7 p.m. In the evenings, they liked to play tabletop games. Their son played with the parents, while the twins would sit on either side of him, commenting on the game and learning how to play it. Those were happy days. Many people even envied them. What a close-knit family they were. Some even asked what their secret was. No secret. Happiness is where it's valued and where there's love and support. Amy would usually reply, but few people seemed to believe her. Then the phone call came. She was making tea for her mother and answered the phone to hear a cold voice. Your husband is in a hospital, hurry up. She didn't ask any questions. She just rushed over there with the kids. How could she go without them? It was their daddy. 
She made it in time and flew into the ward, out of breath, tears rolling down her cheeks. John was just lying there motionless, pale, his eyes closed. He looked strangely older to Amy, even though she had only seen him the day before. Amy froze for a moment, and then she kneeled down by the bed. She was crying and praying for him not to abandon them. While she was still in the corridor, the doctor warned her that John did not stand a single chance. He had only a few hours left. The children were waiting in the corridor for their mother to call them. But she couldn't. She just could not let go of her beloved husband. He took a breath, slightly opened his heavy eyelids and looked at his wife. Don't cry. Don't. He whispered to her with just his lips. I've lived a long and happy life. Amy tried to say something, but John spoke again. Bring me my jacket. She rose, took it off the peg, and brought it over. He struggled to find the right pocket, reached into it, got out a sheet of paper, and extended it to his wife. Go to this address. He'll explain everything. How are the kids? Amy called the children. They did not cry. Only the elder one was hiding his eyes so that the girls would not see him. They kissed their father, asking him to get well. Then he was gone. He just closed his eyes and fell asleep, never to wake up again. Amy did not remember signing the papers and exiting the hospital. The three days that followed were virtually erased from her memory. The morgue, the funeral, the wake. She was on automatic pilot. Then she woke up. Why is she feeling sorry for herself and neglecting her children? They are having as much of a hard time as she is. She lost her husband, and they lost their father. She also recalled her husband's last request for her to go to the address that he gave her. Amy began frantically searching for the note, hopefully still lying in one of her pockets. Thank God she didn't lose it. When she came to that address, there was nothing special to be seen. Just a quiet yard with a playground. No stores, no offices, just residential high-rises and nothing more. Amy passed through the yard and entered the house. The door was answered by a woman no older than 30. She said hello, ushered Amy inside, seated her in an armchair, and offered her coffee. Amy just kept on nodding, not really understanding what that was all about. Seeing the state she was in, the woman added a liberal splash of cognac to her coffee and extended it to the guest. Go on, have it, and then we'll talk. Nodding again, Amy emptied the cup in one mighty gulp and went into a coughing fit, which strangely reminded her that she was still alive. All this time, the woman sat and waited. You are Amy, I assume? Yes, this is me, and you will be? My name is Tina. We will talk a little bit, if you don't mind, until my husband comes around. Maybe I will come later? No, 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 it's alright. He is coming any minute now. We've been waiting for you. Why? You are about to find out. At that moment, there was a sound of the front door opening, and a man entered the apartment, short with balding hair and kind eyes. Oh, Amy, you are here. I'm very sorry. Please accept my sympathy. We grieve together with you. John was a great man. They talked for about two hours. It was already getting dark, and it was time for Amy to hurry back home to her children. Amy parted cordially with Tina and her husband and called a taxi. At home, however, she was in for a real shock. The children were crying, and some woman Amy didn't know was running around the house packing up their things. Excuse me, who are you? And what are you doing? At last, I thought I'd have to wait forever. Well, allow me to introduce myself. I am Kate, John's sister. And this? She pointed at the man who came in. My husband, Dave. So, for your information, you cannot live here anymore. I pitied you enough as it is and waited until the end of the funeral and then a few days more. John's parents entered the room. They were clearly avoiding eye contact with Amy and their grandchildren. They just sat on the couch and stared at the opposite wall as if what was going on had nothing to do with them. I don't understand. On what grounds have you broken into our house? What's going on? On the grounds that John was my blood brother, and I am more than sure that he bequeathed everything to us. But if you disagree, we'll see you in court. How can you? Amy turned to John's parents. These are your grandchildren, for God's sake. Did you decide to throw them out on the street at night? The mother paused and raised a look full of anger at her daughter-in-law. Why out on the street? For all I know, you have a mother. Go to her. No, this is our house. Wrong, this is our house. And everything that's in it is also ours. He didn't put anything on you. 
We checked, so don't act like you own this place. You've had your share of good living. Now pack your things and go. You can't do this to me. Yes, we can. John was very quick to help everyone, with the sole exception of his own family. It's time to pay your bills, dear. You yourself never lifted a finger to help. And now, how dare you? Don't you have any conscience at all? Don't try to manipulate us with your conscience, bullshit. Alright, then I've got one more thing to tell you. Amy reached into her pocket, took out a piece of paper, and folded it and began reading. The longer she read, the angrier the uninvited guests became. Amy read them the will, written in John's handwriting and notarized by the notary, whom she just visited today. According to the last will of the deceased, all of his assets passed to his wife. His bank accounts were closed while he was still alive and all the money in them was divided equally among his children and transferred to savings accounts until they reached age. There was not a single word in the will about his sister or his parents. Amy extended the sheet to the stunned relatives. Destroy it if you like, it's a copy. Now get off my property, or I'll be forced to call the police. John knew he was sick, and he knew what kind of family he had. So he took care of all the formalities well in advance in order to make sure that his family did not suffer from his ungrateful relatives. They were milking him as it was, getting a handsome monthly allowance on their bank accounts. However, John knew that their appetite would grow, and they would inevitably claim this house as well. Amy had settled down already, but... Back in the notary's apartment, she cried her heart out, mourning her beloved husband and thanking him endlessly. Even after his death, John took good care of them, like a guardian angel.